Uh, welcome to our final panel of the afternoon. And if you were at the last one, I don't know that we will break down into fist fights that we, as we nearly did in the last one, but it was a <laughs> fabulous, fabulous panel. And uh, I thank them. I thank everybody uh, who has taken part in the symposium today. And I thank all of these <coughs> fellows and women, my dear friend Susan Slusser. I'll introduce them all in a second. I also want to thank Paul Herzog. He's, that was, there's Paul. Paul was from the class of 74. We actually <laughs> crossed paths. I was a freshman because his class took over the student center. My class didn't have to. So thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Power to the people. I want to thank our partners and Paul especially for their uh, generous support. Uh, Paul from the class of 74, chartered financial consultant from Mass Mutual, helping to underwrite the program today. Uh, let me introduce everybody. You've got the program, so we don't have to go into any great details about each of their, their great careers. And uh, I couldn't be happier that they are here. And, and I thank them when, when I ask, will you come? And they say, yes. Well, OK, then. We'll begin with Tyler Kepner, national baseball writer for the New York Times. Next to him, Pedro Moore from The Athletic. He covers the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, Pedro is a relatively speaking young fella, and I, wa I wanted young, old, male, female, broadcast, columnist, beat writer in this, this uh, group. Susan Slusser has been covering uh, the Oakland A's since the days of Connie Mack, when they were in <laughs> Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> and Susan is... Uh, back for the second consecutive year, as is Rick Hummel, who's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the quintessential baseball writer in the country from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And next to me here is Chris Mad Dog Russo, who is on the radio, who is on television, and never is at a loss for words. And a little later on at for 7 o'clock. For better or worse. For, for better, better or worse. <laughs> see? Um, <coughs> we will we'll chat in greater detail, Chris and I, tonight at seven. And the title of this panel is The State of Baseball. It's the national pastime. Uh, and I wonder, I'm going to ask each of them for the next minute or two just what their thought is of where the game is today. Uh, the news of the day, for instance, uh, Rob Manfred, the baseball commissioner, had his contract extended through 2024. Uh, Fox has re-upped its television contract for Major League Baseball for the next thousand years. Uh, we have just come off a World Series between two iconic franchises, the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Boston Red Sox, and yet the ratings were down 27% from a year ago, and we wonder why. Um, and, and, and from that point, let us begin. Start with you, Tyler. You had a wonderful column about the state of the game, what, six weeks ago or so? Yeah, I mean, I, it, I feel like it's a... People always say football is the number one sport now because they take polls and people say that's their favorite sport. I do think it's important to point out that baseball has so much programming and so, such a high volume of entertainment to sell that they do do a pretty good job selling it, even if you include the minor leagues, which have you know five months of a schedule. Major league teams, you know, have 162 games, and they do average, you know, almost 30,000 a game. And these teams do well locally in their ratings. So that's the good stuff. Okay, that baseball is still popular enough to sustain itself for all those teams, all those markets, college, major league, or minor league, whatever. But having covered it now for 21 years for newspapers, um, it's changing a lot, and I'm not sure it's changing in good ways. Um, the thing that I notice most profoundly when I compare it to other sports, is, because analytics are everywhere. Analytics are, are information, numbers. You can't stop teams from wanting to, wanting to know more about how to win. Um, but it feels like in football and basketball, the analytics promote a faster game, a more exciting game, let's say. Um, more, more of a passing game in football, more three-point shots. 
in basketball. The scores go up, um, fans' interest is, is heightened. But in baseball, it's all about keeping the ball out of play. It's about taking the possibility of a hit away from the batter. So it's about striking him out, or it's about hitting a home run, because hitting a home run is the quickest and most efficient way to score. Um, hitters think, well, these guys are throwing so hard, they got such nasty breaking stuff. It's harder to get three hits and score a run. Why don't I just try to get a mistake and, and yank one into the seats? Um, and when you eliminate the possibilities that baseball presents um, by putting the ball in play, by fielders going everywhere, by bunting or stealing bases, um, it's less interesting. And so I feel like the game has less action now and it's less interesting in a way because that's what the analytics are promoting. Players know that's how you get paid and athletes are good enough to where they can respond to those incentives. Pedro, does the industry to some degree forget it's also an entertainment commodity? I wonder that. But as Tyler said, the industry is making money. The Dodgers are worth a ton of money. The, you know, the Dodgers have basically been in the business of making their game less interesting in every possible way for the last 15 years since data has become prevalent. And yet, people are still going to the ballpark. People are still Instagramming from Dodger Stadium. It's, it's a lucrative thing. So I, I, don't, I don't know. If, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to come up with a way in which baseball has become more interesting in recent years. Basically, everything is geared towards less action less interesting things to watch as a fan. And I, I sit there a lot during the summer, and I'm sure you do too, and I wonder how I would be at this game if I, wasn't, if I didn't have my computer in front of me, if I didn't have something to, to distract me, because it's, it's three hours and 40 minutes, you know, for, an av for a reasonably normal game. In Probably the, seven hours and 20 yeah. minutes. <laughs> game three. Hey. I try not to remember that. <laughs> so it's just, it, it's, um, I'm conflicted between, I see this game, I grew up watching this game, and I know it's not as fun to watch now. And wondering where it's gonna go, because like Tyler said, baseball players are, are you know, the new generation of ball players are smart. The Dodgers have a couple guys, someone like Walker Buehler, who's built himself into a hard thrower who's probably gonna get hurt at some point. You know, and, and that's not good for the game to have your be you know, the best pitchers out for two years, right? They're, in a lot of ways, the star power of, of the sport is, is sort of vanished. I mean, how many of you in this room know more than than 20 or 30 baseball players, I wonder. You know, and even in LA, Mike Trout, I used to cover him. He's not, not a prominent figure at all. Uh, and he's, you know, Mad Dog might disagree, but he's one of the, the best baseball players to ever live. And so I don't know where it's gonna go. I don't, I don't see the future of this being good. That's what my rational side says. But then also, it's making money. And it That's always endures somehow. It's endured strikes and scandals. And gambling we lived and through the strikes but, and, and right. that set the game back quarter century. Right, but that's off the field stuff, and now we're talking about the, the on-field product seems to be diminishing in, in excitement and interest. Ms. Slusser, what say ye? Well, uh, uh, the last couple of years in the off-season, uh, I've started covering some different things just to kind of keep my hand in, and I, I got became very interested in esports because they're becoming so popular, and I think that the generation, your generation, um, mostly is came up with video games, social media, uh, esports, and I th think that maybe the attention span is changing and baseball is diminishing. It, baseball's attendance was down three million this year. That's not insignificant. It's still making money, but it's losing money it could have been making a few years ago, and that trend is, does not seem to be reversing. I also think baseball does not do a very good job of marketing its best players, which is why people don't know Mike Trout. And they kind of shoot themselves in the foot because they spend a lot of time hand wringing what's going wrong with our game. There's so many problems with our game. That winds up being a headline a lot more than the good things about the game. Uh, so yeah, I, th I think baseball actually is in trouble and I, th I think this is the generation that they're losing. Rick Hummel has been in St. Louis. He knew Lewis before he was a saint. <laughs> <laughs> what? What is your perception? Where is the game now? Where has it been? And where do you suppose it is heading? I'm very conflicted by baseball's fervent desire to make the games go faster during the season. They're always chasing pitching coaches and catchers away from the mound, try to speed up play. I understand that to some degree. And they're trying to shave maybe a five minutes off a three hour and five minute game. However, in the postseason, when you're not allowed to step out of the batter's box 
at all during the regular season. You can get one foot out and one foot in. Every hitter steps out, wanders around. Pitchers step off. They change signs. Catchers go to the mound. You get six visits, for crying out loud, in a nine-inning game. And you get a few more in extra innings for 18 innings. And suddenly, they don't care how long the game lasts. Well, in postseason play, you better care when you start in the East at 8 o'clock or 8.15, and suddenly the games are being played at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning. You've, you've lost your audience. I'm not sure when those ratings are taken, but there's not many people watching at 2 o'clock in the morning, even if the Dodgers and Red Sox are playing. So why, why is there a, a, a disconnect between the regular season, oh, let's play, play fast, postseason, oh, we don't care. Take as long as you'd like, you know. We don't care. Um, and, and then all this drama is built up. When you're watching a football game, well, the ball's not in play more than about 12 minutes of an hour, okay? But, but um, the anticipation for the play is great. Okay, they're finally going to the line. There's going to be a play. This happens in baseball. Here comes the play. Ball one. Oh, boy, that was exciting. Bad <laughs> 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 dog? Well, I think... Um, and when I was growing up, baseball was probably right there with football, one and one A. Now, this is in the 70s, but one and one A. Baseball now is behind the NBA. I have young kids, teenage kids. I mean, they're more wrapped up in what the Lakers are doing against Portland than they care about a playoff baseball game. And this is Lakers-Portland regular season basketball where all of us on this panel and you guys out there right now can tell you it's Golden State against whomever in the NBA Finals. So there's not a lot of drama in the regular season. Baseball, you can't predict that. Basketball, you can, yet basketball is a bigger sport right now in, than baseball, which is really hard to believe when you, from, my, from my perspective. Baseball needs to get themselves back in the national conversation. How? Well, that's a very good question. One of the ways they get back on ESPN. Um, think about it. When you watch any of these TV shows, I don't watch them, but Undisputed, First Take, uh, all these Fox and ESPN shows, they never do baseball. Never. Amazing. Think about it. They had a baseball playoff game on. I don't know what game it was. It was sometime in October. And undisputed, big game. It was the Red Sox. When Bregman made the out, last out of game four, and Bayantendi made that catch on left field. Yeah, game five. The game, game four, uh, it was no, game, game four. four. Game four. four. In Houston. The next morning, the next, undisputed, right. on for two hours, did not discuss it. This is one of the reasons why it was over at 1.33 in the morning. But think about that for a minute. That, that's hard to believe. This is a playoff game between the Red Sox and the Houston Astros that they did not discuss the play. On uh, first take, you know what the first story was? If Bill Belichick saying that the Kali Mack is not as good as Lawrence Taylor. Patriots are playing the Bears that week. He obviously coached LT with the Giants. This is a, base, a baseball playoff game going on, a championship game, not some game in June. A championship game. So somehow baseball has to get back involved in a national conversation. There's a lot of reasons, of how, a lot of answers to that. Quickness, pace, they play too many games. It's 162. Now, I'm a baseball traditionalist. I'd hate to see it lessen because I love the records more than anybody. But think about it. Football plays 16 games. You have to play 10 baseball games to get to one football game. Baseball game averages about three hours and 20 minutes a game. Football game is over in three hours. Think about that for a minute. That's on Sunday afternoons. And you can play fantasy, and you can, you can gamble. You can do anything you want. It's three hours in and out, 16 games. Baseball is 162 games. Baseball season starts, and the NCAA tournament is not even concluded. When it ends, the next NCAA year in college basketball begins. That's, there's, a, that's, there's a lot of, in this day and age, in 2018, those are problems that they have to somehow figure out a way to correct. Spring training begins around Valentine's Day, and the baseball season ends around Halloween. That's too long. Every day. It's <laughs> relentless. Um, you, you, I, think it's, I think that's great, though. I think that's, I think that's one of the great things about baseball, is you have twice as many games as basketball and hockey and ten times as many as... As football, I think that's some of the good stuff. I don't think that was a problem when you were growing up in the 70s, when I was growing up in the 80s, um, and baseball was much more popular. 
Um, so I don't think the amount of games is the problem. In fact, I think baseball is one of the reasons I love it so much is because it's always there for you. Every six, day, six months a year, flip on the radio, turn on the TV, now on your, on your phone, you can always find a game. It's great. It's a constant companion. But our generation feels that way. But the younger generation wants that instant gratification. But they can, they can get and it. He, it. He knows that why do I pay attention in April when we can watch in October and we can see your wins? Well, the, a, by, I'll counter that, though. Why, why do they but care they about... But they like the personalities in the NBA. They like yeah. LeBron and the and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but so like why, yeah, but why do they... Is it just personalities? Because otherwise, you know, a, a, a November game between Portland and the Lakers... I could care for a less. team For a sport that sends more playoffs, playoff teams than baseball. Oh, that's a joke. Right. I ask these kids, how many of you love the NBA? Yeah. How many of you love baseball? All right, well, well I'm wrong. Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> they are here for a baseball panel. Uh, that's true. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said to me yesterday, they had, they had two televisions on in, in, in their living room, one with a baseball game and one with a hockey game. And the baseball sound was down, the hockey was up, and it occurred to me that the hockey game, there was constant movement on the screen. The television, they're standing around waiting for ball one. <laughs> and, and, and this is now heading into 2019, new time, new place, new generation. What is baseball able to do if we are seeing it trending down to stop the trend and, and you know, as Pedro says, right now it's still in a very good place. You got a lot of people making a lot of money, and I would suggest a lot of the money coming more from the internet than from paid attendance and television and anything else. Where do we go? How do we do it? So it's up to you now. Uh, well, I talked to a couple of players yesterday who I typically talk to for stories about pace of play and problems of baseball. Um, Jed Lowry, who's the A's second baseman, and Kurt Suzuki, who was the A's catcher and uh, spent last year, the last two years with Atlanta. Um, and they gave me different answers. Uh, Jed Lowry has always uh, proposed a smaller strike zone. He thinks that, because he's a hitter, so he mm -hmm. thinks that uh, with a smaller strike zone, players will have to you know, swing it at pitches more. They won't like wait as much. They'll know that pitchers are going to have to come in the strike zone. Suzuki thinks exactly the opposite. He said, make, make it a bigger strike zone, because hitters then are really going to have to start swinging the bat a little more. Shifts are taking away so much. And scouts tell me that they'll go 20 minutes without seeing a ball put in play. And the drama of baseball, it's having runners on base and balls put in play. But it's turned into the sport where you can just go, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes with nothing, uh, nothing happening besides strikeouts. Maybe, uh, the, maybe the most illuminating stat of the year came from a piece that Tom Verducci did in SI. And the average time between a ball put in play until the next one is three minutes and 45 seconds. That is to say, Foul back, taking a walk, um, walk up music to get to home plate. And so you've got almost four minutes of nothing going on and then maybe a ground ball to second base into a shift. What do you do about that, Kamish? Well, two things here. One is that maybe more teams will play like the Red Sox and actually play ball. They have analytics available. All teams have the same stats. The Red Sox use them as necessary. They're not wed to them. They can divorce themselves from some of these things. I mean, you don't see the Boston outfielders being changed around every inning. You don't see six different guys playing second base in a game. But they play, they move runners over. Ben Attendee moves runners over, he hits second. Anyway, that's one thing. And if you're going to get serious about visits to the mound, knock it down to about two or three a game, then we'll see we just can't go out there every time a new pitcher comes in or whatever, we're going to change the sign. Let's get you got two chances to go out there. You better use them carefully. Much has been made about the shift and the three players on the right side of the infield and uh, the outfield. Uh, and there's talk about legislating against the shift. What are your thoughts on that, for instance, Pedro, or maybe they should start teaching hitters how to hit the other way. Location, location, location. I think that is going to happen. I, I, I believe that. I think that... Legislating I, against... No, oh. I, I don't think... I, I think there's too much... There'd be too much pushback. I do think we're going to see the, the counteracting of some of what data has brought us in baseball. 
I think that we're going to see some, well, we're going to see it continue in some ways. I mean, like starting pitchers are going to throw less, fewer and fewer innings, I believe. And we're going to have a bunch of multi-inning pitchers, relievers, starters, whatever. But I think we're going to see young players learn in the minor leagues and high school and college how to hit against the shift. Because the guys have come up, you know, Cody Bellinger, great hitter, rookie of the year in 2017, really had no knowledge until this season of how to do that, of how to hit the ball where he wanted to. And he's working on it, but he, he's behind. You know, he's, he's, he spent his entire minor league career learning how to hit home runs. And then, they, and then he got to the major leagues and he hit a bunch of home runs and then they adjusted to him. And then he was like, okay, what do I do now? And, but it's going to take a long time. I think it's going to take a half generation for, the, for that to be fixed, I guess. And I would like to see, you know, I guess in some way you could fix it just by dropping down a bunt. But a lot of guys don't practice that. You know, I hear fans all the time clamoring for guys to bunt. I mean, how many times did you see Max Muncy practice a bunt in batting practice? <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So it's, uh, it's going to take a little while. I think I, I trust that the new generation of baseball players is going to, be, uh, is going to understand how to, how to best behave for their own benefit. And that's going to involve beating some of the data. We were talking last night, the Texas Rangers came in to play the Dodgers in June, I think it was, and they have a left-handed power-hitting first baseman named Joey Gallo, who hits about 40 home runs. He knocks in 80, 90, 100 runs and strikes out 10,000 times. On this particular afternoon, I don't believe it was a, a, a afternoon, evening, doesn't matter, uh, the Dodgers put four outfielders. They took one of the infielders and put four up. They had three on the right side of the infield, the shift. <laughs> he had 115 feet to do anything he wanted, and he struck out swinging twice. That is, to me, was the whole issue of the game in 2018. God bless Joey Gallo. I'm sure he's a fine fellow from a fine family. <laughs> but... You know, baseball's all about location, real estate, buying 90 feet at a time. Well, here's uh, what I thought, you know, the Rays got a lot of attention, um, obviously, for their bullpenning, um, you know, using relievers as starters. But they did something else interesting, I thought, this year. They were a real big home run, big swing and miss, a swing for the fences team last year. And this year, they weren't. They had a lot of 300 hitters. Imagine that, a 300 hitter. You know, guys who could put the ball in play, contact guys, Malik Smith, who they just traded, and Joey, Ga uh, not Joey Gallo, Joey Wendell, and, um, you know, Matt Duffy, and guys like that, and they won 90 games. And I wonder if eventually this will become a supply and demand thing where there's so, so much of a supply of home run hitters, of guys who can launch but strike out a lot, that they're not going to get paid. We saw that already a little bit last year. Mike Moustakis and Logan Morrison, they just didn't get paid very much because there's a lot of people like them. But if, if, if you start paying for guys who can put the bat on the ball and make contact, these athletes are so good that that's what they'll respond to. You want me to put the bat on the ball? Okay. If that's how I'm getting paid, I'll make more contact. Um, but it, maybe it'll take a little time to see that, you know, that those guys are, are in, in less of a supply, so there'll be more demand and they'll make more money. That's what I'm hoping anyway. And I'm hoping that, as you say, there are examples of the Red Sox who don't strike out a ton, the Astros last year who didn't strike out a lot, those Royals teams and Giant teams that didn't strike out a lot, they all won World Series. Like maybe, maybe that'll start to catch on. It hasn't really yet, but I think if you want to win the World Series, you can't just have a team full of strikeout guys. Rick? You know, there must be a stat. That I want to see the stat that, that says how many pitchers can actually throw the ball where these teams are shifting to. I mean, you, can, you might see a guy the whole infield shifted to the right side, and the guy's trying to throw outside corner pitches to a left-handed hitter. What good is that? You know, I mean, how many guys can actually do this? We see the balls that are here in the shift. How about all the walks that are issued for the pitcher not throwing the ball where he should be throwing it when you're going into a shift? Um, they aren't all unsuccessful. The, these things, the shifts do work sometimes, but sometimes they don't, they don't make any difference at all because the pitcher doesn't do his job. Oh, how, do you, uh, how do you make the game more entertaining? Now? Well, I think a little of this is it will correct itself. I am not a. I have no problem with the shifts. You can't tell Bill Belichick what to do with his defense. <coughs> he wants a blitz or safety. He can do what he wants. He wants to put a defensive lineman back in coverage. You can do that. Those are 11 pieces in football that you should be able to utilize. That You can play zone in the NBA. Center can patrol the middle. 
on protector rim. So you should be able to utilize your defenders. That's part of sports, and it's up to the offense to figure out how to kind of attack that, and I think eventually you'll see that. I think you got a couple of problems here that need to, that is very problematic. I think this year in baseball, they had a bad year. They had terrible weather in the East Coast. The races were atrocious. The Yankees and Red Sox had nothing to worry about. The Indians won by 100 games. I mean, there wasn't, a, a Chicago Milwaukee had a little bit at the end, but, and a little bit of the NL West, but it, it wasn't as dramatic as you'd like. They had a terrible postseason. The Astros swept the Indians. The Yankees didn't show up against the Red Sox. You got no game five. You had a seven hour and 20 minute game of the World Series that ended at 3.30 in the morning. I think that has something to do, and you had games on FX, for crying out loud. Yeah, the only game seven was on FS1 because, because Fox preferred and the Oregon-Washington football game. And that tells you something about baseball, game. that Fox put the Oregon-Washington Oregon Washington State. This is not Michigan. <laughs> this is not Michigan, Ohio State. This is right. Oregon. <laughs> Washington State's won a roll. Yeah, that's <laughs> But I mean, geez, and they put that game on Fox. I had, that was on, uh, game they seven. put that on Fox. On, take all game. Yeah. They put that on, F, on Fox in game seven. They put the Brewers and Dodgers on FS1. That is a problem. I mean, geez, that's got to be corrected. But baseball, they sign away. They want the money. So they make this deal with Fox, and they just extended it today. Because Charlie, they, they take all the money. When you take all the money, Fox tells you when the game's going to be on. The only league that can tell the networks what to do is the NFL. They will pick the games when they want the games on, who they want televising. They have flex with the schedule because the NFL is God Almighty, and the, NFL, and the networks need the NFL. Baseball can't do that. So baseball takes every penny, and then they give up their rights to the games. And you go to hotels in America, and you're on the road, and a playoff game is on FS1, the game is not on TV. You gotta go outside with your pajamas on, <laughs> pair of slippers, and, and a co in Alabama, Hunts, I'm getting called, Huntsville, Alabama, to find a Red Sox Astro game. Playoffs, this is ridiculous. You think Goodell will let that happen? Patriots and Chiefs in an AFC championship game, and it's on cable TV. That, that's got to change. I mean, and the other big issue, and I'm not shut up, is that there is a lot of problems right now between the union and the commissioner's office. The union, last year they're annoyed, no big contracts. Tony Clark and company, and Tony Clark is very nervous about his future. They will not really sit at the table with the commissioner's office to work out pace of play issues, what we can do as a group to make the game a little bit more exciting. I think you will see them a little better this offseason once these two guys get signed and all the money they get. But there has to be some sort of relationship between the commissioner's office and Tony Clark and the Players Association. And for the last year, year and a half, there's been none. And that's why you don't see any pace of play initiatives. That's why Rick's making fun of the mound visits. That's why they only came up with the four things for the passport for the intentional walk. Because they, the player association doesn't want to play ball with the owners. So as a result, nothing gets done. And these three hour and 45 minute games become three hours and 45 minute games. That needs to be corrected. We'll see if they can do that this off season. And if, if that relationship gets worse, in a few years, this all this stuff we're talking about will it's be nothing, nothing be because they, they won't be able to be a strike. And that will be the worst thing baseball ever because that, that right baseball can't afford that right now i mean it's had labor peace since 1994 95 and we're still talking about it it it's struggling a little bit imagine if they start quarreling over shutting down this game over salaries and stuff i remember one other thing the the owners for the first time in forever killed the players in that last negotiation mm -hmm. because for the first time since 1966 the owners are smarter than the players manford Hall, dan hallam and their front office is smarter than right now than Tony Clark, the player's guy. And he got killed in that, pl in that player. The players wanted omelets at spring training. They wanted with this, with everybody having a cook. The players wanted to make sure that everybody on spring training road trips, there was a seat next to them free when they got on the bus. So they didn't have to have two people sitting next to them. While what the owners wanted were the big the international draft and all these things, compensate, and the owners won. And that sat very poorly with those players who are very competitive. You don't get to be a major league baseball player by not being competitive. These guys are competitive. That's why they're great. 
And they are going to fight back next time with that strike. And that's going to be very, very dangerous for the sport. You agree with all that? Yeah. Susan, I'm going to ask you, how do you make the game more entertaining against that backdrop? That, that's the one thing I think we all tend to forget. Baseball is an entertainment product. People want to go out and eat their popcorn and drink their beer and boo and cheer, and they don't want to hear about strikes. And Lord knows I covered every one of them from the late 70s through 94. Spent more time in the lobby of the Doral Hotel than I would ever care to admit. Uh, how, do, how do we bring the, you know, That's not to say we don't have fans, and Lord knows we have a lot of fans. But it appears to, I think, all of us, it's heading in a downward trend. I won't call it a spiral quite yet. How do we put on the brakes and how do we get the fans more engaged and how do we make that product on television more fun to watch? Well, I don't know if this will necessarily help with the television aspect, but I, I cover a team that's the second team in the market, the Oakland A's. Obviously, the Giants are the big team in the market. The A's attendance has suffered over the years and they have a terrible building that's... Um, exactly the same age as me, which always makes me feel bad when people are like, oh, it's obsolete. <laughs> well, that's terrible. You but have aged <laughs> so much better. Yes. better than the so don't compare Thank yourself you. to the Coliseum. So nice. <laughs> uh, but the A's have done some really revolutionary things in the last year or two because our attendance is so bad. They had a free game for all their fans at one point last year, um, which created a lot of goodwill for a team that had kind of lost its fan base for, from tra having a terrible building and trading a lot of its most popular players. And for this next coming season, they're instituting something I think a lot of teams besides Boston or Chicago that sell out regularly will start to do um, in part because your generation is so used to the subscription kind of idea for getting things. They're going to subscriptions rather than season tickets. Uh, and if you get like a sort of a traditional season ticket plan where say you get a 10 game package, you now get to go to all of the Oakland A's games over the course of the season. It includes the right to go into the stadium for all of them. You can hang out in the uh, standing room only areas and the bars and the taverns and the plaza where there are food trucks. And you can upgrade to a seat if you want. But every single season ticket package comes with 162 games. And they've sold four times more tickets, season tickets to date than they did at this point last year. They're going through the roof. And I think uh, they're trying to come up with more and more sort of uh, interesting and different ideas to bring fans in. And they're, they're successful at it. Pedro, conversely, the Dodgers uh, lead the league in home and road attendance, and it seems to have been an annual thing now for nearly a decade. What, from your perspective, having listened to what Susan said, how, how do we generate the vibe more than where it is now? Or in L.A., is it just an outlier and everything's fine? Yeah, it, it would be hard to look at the numbers and say that the Dodgers have any sort of a problem with their product on the field, right? I mean, there's you, you, the games at home, there's generally 45, 46,000 people there. It's, it takes forever to get in, forever to get out. It's packed every night. So it, it, it's, I can't really rationally sit up here and say that they have a problem with their on-field product. Now, in a decade, when a generation of fans in that city has grown up without being able to watch the games on television, then they might have a real problem. Because now for four years, the Dodgers have been unable to be seen on local TV to 67% of, their, their, uh, of the metro area. So someone like me who grew up a fan because it was available on TV, because like Tyler said, every night it was something that I could watch. You know, from 8 to 15, it was my nightly activity was watching the Dodgers. And the, these kids now, they don't have that. And so it's still a social activity going to the games. And they're still making millions off of fans going there and buying the popcorn and beer. But I... And it's fine right now. It's fine right now. But I just don't know where that's going to go. Because how would you be a fan of the Dodgers if you were born five years ago, six years ago, and you're never going to be able to see them on TV other than in the playoffs when they're on FS1? And Tyler, you started covering the Yankees in 2002, the same year that, that I did. Um, so you have a Yankee perspective, which is heading in a different direction, I think, than it was then in terms of packing the stadium. There are a lot of empty seats, at least on my screen when I watch a Yankee game. And from a Yankee perspective then to now, and from a national perspective where you get a chance to see teams around the country, what is your overview on all of that? On the Yankees or on just... Just having from there to now where... How do we make it more interesting, entertaining, and stop the slide? Yeah, well... 
as far as the Yankees, they do. They are still number one in the American League in attendance, but they have those. It, it looks visually awful because so many fans in the best seats don't sit in them. Or they they go to the bar underneath, and so people are like, "Why does nobody have the Yankees games?" But um, they had their best ratings in six years on Yes um, this past year, and so they're they're doing okay. But you know, you travel around and you just see so many teams now that. Um, yeah, they really they tore down the roster and, and, and they're starting over because I think they think that's the best way to do it. And, and they might not be wrong when you look and you see that the Cubs and the Astros had these protracted, uh, the, the Royals before them, um, these protracted rebuilds. And, uh, you know, they got the high picks and a lot of money to spend on the, on, on amateurs and, uh, and they won. Um, but what that, I think, has done is a lot of team, a lot of fan bases are saying, you know what? You guys are hunting on this season or waiting for better times. I might support that idea, but I'm not going to pay to see these, you know, these fill-in sort of guys, just, just uh, you know, replacement basically level guys. Um, so attendance went way down in a lot of those places, and, and, and I think that's, that's a problem. And, and the commissioners talked about it, um, about the, the difficulty of addressing something like that, because, you know, how do you stop teams from building the way they want to build or from having a philosophy that, that they think is going to help them win. Philadelphia this year improved to 80 wins over 67 or 66 the year before. They made a, a pretty big improvement. That's my hometown, and a lot of people just didn't connect with that team because they kind of deliberately played a pretty boring style of play. I mean, they, they I think, were third in the majors in strikeouts, probably middle of the pack in home runs. The Phillies were last in the majors in hits. So you go to these games, and there's even though they won almost half their games, there were just not a lot of balls in play, like we've been saying. Um, so, you know, that's a problem. If a team makes a 14-game improvement and the city's just like, eh, this product is really boring. You're changing relievers over and over and over again. I mean, Kapler loves to play matchups. And it just got tedious. At a beautiful ballpark in a city that's crazy for sports, they just sort of shrugged. And that's a problem because the, they were reacting to the style of play, not the result. So on one hand, you have teams that are rebuilding, and then there's the disparity between the good and the bad, and as a consequence not a lot of enough interesting games as, as you were suggesting. And then on the other hand, you have a metrically driven game where there's not a lot of action going on mm -hmm. in a desire to win, but in a rather antiseptic way. Fair? Yeah, but there's an easy answer to this. It's put the ball in play. Make television use all its cameras to find the ball, find guys running, find fielders chasing balls, find infielders. I've covered ball for five decades, and if you hit the ball, all these guys are not wearing gold gloves on their hands. They, they will miss some of them. They will throw some of them away. And those are exciting plays. Yeah. Ball goes in the stands. Guys are circling the bases, but you can't do that with a strikeout unless Grandal's catching. And then the ball goes to the screen. You got <laughs> you got stuff going on then. But <laughs> otherwise, not too exciting. But make make teams make plays. I think big league teams take the other side too much for granted that they're going to catch everything that's there to them. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're, they spend all their time hitting in the minor leagues and pitching. They don't spend that much time on fielding, not as relative to the other two parts of the game. So just put the ball in play and make this, the images on the screen move rather than the catcher going, or in Grandel's case, running back to the... <laughs> <laughs> Rick, you covered the, the run in Redbirds, the, the 80s, when they ran all the time, the Cardinals. And, and I remember watching those teams and thinking, there's so many things that could happen right now. If he gets on base, he's going to run. Then he's going to, you know, the... the the pickoff moves and all that stuff, bunting, all this stuff. Can we ever get back to that kind of game? Players don't run anymore. Nobody, Maybe not. You know with the, the, the guy had the, what, how many, 43 steals this year led the league. Nobody yeah. stole more than 45 bases. Yeah. Cardinals will do that in a half a season. Maybe not with the turf, but if you could do that. And the other team was petrified. That the, and anybody, Vince Coleman or Ozzie Smith or Willie McGee got on base, right. they would take, you know, like you say, step off, throw over. And here's Jack Clark waiting to hit, you know, because he knew he was going to get a fastball down that. the middle eventually. That was eventually. fun baseball. Yeah, and... Uh, uh, other teams tried to play that way. The Cardinals had a certain brand of player that, that they had more of that type of player than anybody else did. But the, it was electric. That's when they started drawing 3 million people. Mm -hmm. And they did it for a bunch of years after that. But it went from 2 million to 3 million just because of that style of play. And it wasn't so much Whitey Bots. The that's the kind of team he, he played different ball in Texas and Kansas City when he managed. But that's the players that he had. He knew the field he had. He knew how big the ballpark was. They couldn't hit home runs anyway. So why mm -hmm. try? I think we have to remember baseball is at its highest level is still the best game. No clock. Got to get 27 outs. Every other game got a clock. 
So when you get to that moment in baseball where there's something on the line and not a game in June, where there is something on the line in October where there's a lot of drama and it's every pitch, no sport tops it. Not a drive in the NFL, not, not game seven of the NBA final, although obviously we've had a few good ones there too with Golden State. But for the most part, that is, you can, you can analyze what the manager does. You could, I mean, the crowd intensity, it's as good as it gets. The problem that we have in baseball, you have to watch a lot of games and spend six months, sometimes seven hours and 20 minutes in a game three of the World Series before you get to that moment. When you get to that moment, there's, that's the best moment in sports. I don't, I don't care any other sport is you have to get that 27th out. You don't have to, you know, in any other sport, your clock runs out on you for the most part. So that's where you, you have to figure out a way to create more of those moments where we're all wrapped up in it. And I don't know. It's, it's very tricky about how they're going to do that. I, I think the first big problem is this TV contract. I'm very down on this Fox thing. That's me. These guys here, my esteemed colleagues, might feel a little differently. And the other problem is, too, and Pedro mentioned it, you cannot have a situation where 67% of the second biggest city in the country, it helps Charlie because they got to listen to the radio, <laughs> but they can't watch the Dodgers play. So you, as, as Pedro said, you're sitting in L.A. and the game's not on TV. Why do you think the Lakers are second in town right now? Part of its personality, Kobe, Shaq, you know, LeBron. I mean, they've had those big stars, which sells in L.A. But part of it's the fact that they can see the games. The game, and I blame the Dodgers for that. Because the Dodgers took every freaking penny. They got greedy. They don't care about the rest of the sport. They care about their bottom line. They took every penny. Cable, that cable carrier took, made the deal. And then they tried to pass on their bad deal to the carriages. I said, hold on now, you made the deal. I'm not paying that for the Dodgers. I'll live without the Dodgers. We'll, we'll live without the Dodger games for a little while. And that is a, and baseball can't do much about it because it's sort of an, but that's a major, major problem. You cannot have your games in that market with that franchise, which is the second biggest franchise in the sport. Gi Yankees, Dodgers, Red Sox, Cubs. Those are your four. Giants, Cardinals are right after Cardinals, then, and then the Giants. Those six, and you, you, those games got to be on TV. You know, they have to be, and they're not. And that's a, that's a major problem. They, every unit in baseball acts as a little fiefdom. It's they, 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 they're their own deal. There's no national TV contract for, say, football. The Cowboys aren't on local TV. The football giants, you know, they're not on local TV. Every game's on Sunday afternoon on the networks. And the league does those contracts. That's where they make all their money. Baseball doesn't have that. So it becomes a disparity issue. Dodgers get a billion dollars for TV rights. The Indians get 500 million. How are they supposed to compete? That's where you get into a situation where you have all these teams. Hold on now. I'm going to deal with the Yankees and the Red Sox, so I have all this money in these young players. We'll take it easy for a while. We'll lose 110 games. And that causes a problem. The NFL doesn't worry about that. You name me an NFL team that tanks. Go ahead. Nobody tanks. Right. They, they want to win. Every year in the NFL, six new teams <laughs> make the playoffs. The Browns, you think the Browns tank? They want Mayfield to play. But they fired their coach, didn't they? They ain't win enough. Baseball doesn't have enough of that. So there's a lot of issues that you can, I don't know what the answers are. Mm -hmm. Very tricky. News of the day today is that Commissioner Manfred is in for another, what, five, six years? The television contract with Fox. So, so everything remains the same for the next half dozen years or more. So where and how do they I can't say change course, but at least begin to alter it. I think we're going to see a pitch clock uh, probably next season. Uh, it's probably going to be a large number so that no one is actually interfered with. But I think that it's going to create a little bit of drama at the games. You know, maybe in a big spot, if the pitcher is almost ready, you could see, not quite ready, you could see a countdown. I think we're going to see some changes. I think Manfred is aware of the fact that, that he's losing interest of, the, of, this, of your guys' generation and the generations to come. And that they, they understand that, you know, right now it's fine, but it won't be in, in 10 or 15 years unless they take drastic change. And I think we're going to start to see that. A pitch clock would be something. I mean, that's to, to peers of the game, the traditionalists, this is, I mean, it's a, it's a dramatic change. It's nothing short of a huge genre-breaking change, but I think it's going to happen.
but they're usually in the miners without mm -hmm. it's essentially without an incident. Yeah, nor I mean it's not not been a problem, I and mean, you kind of forget that it's even been happening. It's been happening in the miners for four years, I believe, and nobody even <laughs> talks about it. So yeah. who precisely is opposed to it, and why? People who think, oh, you can't put a clock in baseball, but it's not. It doesn't determine an end point to a game. Right. It just, you know, does the thing the umpires are supposed to be doing. Football. Yeah, Football. the umpires, if the umpires had been more proactive with what they're supposed to do, uh, it wouldn't be necessary, but they're not. Exactly. They you get the ball on faster this way, then. <laughs> I know. Both the excitement of ball one. Both players I talked to yesterday said they think eventually baseball will be a seven-inning sport because the games are so long now and it's untenable and there's no way to really chop off a good chunk without eliminating innings. That's what Jim Pat wants. A seven inning sport with starting pitchers going less innings yeah. and more relievers going more innings with a, sh a shot clock. The fact I talked to only two players yesterday and they both independently mentioned it without me bringing it up makes me think that there's a <coughs> some sort of groundswell among the players about seven innings. It's not a terrible idea. Because Are the players don't want to take less money for playing only seven That's innings. That's a good point. They get less money. But if you shorten the innings in a game, they're still going to get paid the same. No, and, paid. and maybe the teams can still sell beer until the seventh inning. <laughs> even, <laughs> even if it ends in the seventh. It's okay. Oh, the issue will be selling it in the eighth. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to open it up to uh, some questions here that we've been minutes. yammering. Oh, good, so lots of hands. Let's <laughs> front row. Uh, you mentioned earlier mentioned that the NBA has more popularity right now than baseball. Right. And I think that's due to the NCAA's quote unquote super team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think that would be good for baseball? Do you think that could happen in baseball? Um, oh, I definitely could happen. Well, it's, you're not going to have the one because you got five or six teams that have the same payroll, the Yankees and Red Sox. So there's always that combination. In the NBA, it's about players. And if you get two or three different players, you're going to have a super team. You know, you get Durant with Curry and Thompson. Uh, you know, it's it, there's no other team can match that. See, the Yankees can match the Red Sox. The Cubs and the Dodgers, they can match them with finances. And there's enough players to go around. So you won't have that super team aspect. Now, you did with the Yankees about, you know, 20 years ago. But I don't know if that's as prevalent in, the, in baseball as it is in the NBA. Because the NBA, the couple players dominate. You know, and that's why, you know, those two or three guys in the NBA make all the difference in the world. Uh, now, you can make an argument that I do. The NBA regular season to a guy like me who pays attention to it but it's not going to watch every game, I can't get wrapped up in a regular season game between the Golden State Warriors and Atlanta Hawks because they're meaningless. So I can't get wrapped up in that. And part of it is, is I know Golden State at the end of the year is going to be in the finals. That's a problem the NBA has, that I know they know it's a problem, but... At the moment, Golden State's sort of the, it's culture, it's hip hop and all that, everybody's into it. So I don't think the baseball can go that way. You need nine guys in baseball, you don't need two. And you know, it, a lot of other teams have the finances to keep up with the two or three teams that could be more than everybody else, the Yankees and the Red Sox. So as a result, they'd be a little more of an evening out situation. The problem you have in the baseball is you got these 10 teams that cannot deal financially with the big boys, and that's Minis it's you know the, the Royals at the moment, and the White Sox, and you know the, the the Twins, the 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 Orioles, the Tampas, you know, and that makes it tricky for them. They can't win. You know, if you're a Tampa Bay Ray fan right next year, why would you buy tickets? See, the NBA people Nobody buy does. tickets to see the opponent. Well, you, can sell them. well, you could do that. See, Snell, but you, know you don't know when he's you don't know when he's pitching though. You don't know when he's pitching every game. But see, in the NBA, the Nick fans going to buy tickets for Durant. Okay, when, when Jimmy Butler goes to the West Coast, they're going to buy to see him play in Phoenix. People don't buy the opponent. They don't buy the player in baseball. They buy the team. So the, the Yankee fan might buy the Dodger games, but he's not going to go pay money to see Kyle Seeger play. The NBA, they will. But if you're a Tampa fan next year, why, if you really want to be fair about it, you love baseball, fine. Why would you, go, why would you buy, a ticket, a, buy a season ticket plan for the Rays if you want to win? You can't. Get the Yankees and the Red Sox in the division. They're not beating them. It's a problem. It's a problem. Paul. I'm not in favor of it. I don't think it's going to happen. You, one of the charms of baseball is the personality. I, for one, and, and the commish here, Rick, we're old enough. I, I miss the managers with tobacco juice on their jerseys. <laughs> and a puff uh, uh, in their cheek. I've never seen them wear their jerseys, by the way, <laughs> as opposed to these sweatsuits. Oh, isn't that yeah, so? Yeah, yeah. 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 Boy, you're right about that. You know, there's still some 
elemental charm about the game, about arguing, about kicking dirt and all of that stuff that, you know, again, you desire to get the call right, yes. But we go back to the question, is it a, an entertainment product? And uh, to me, that becomes infinitely less entertaining and much more clinical. And as a result, I think it just perpetuates this downward slide. You need, you need personalities. Those things are intrusive. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely fair. Because it just frustrates the viewer. Like, oh, come on. And the electronic strike zone is the same for somebody who's 6'7 as it is for somebody who's 5'7. So Jose Altuve's strike zone is considerably different than Giancarlo Stanton. And so that electronic strike zone is more, it's more television eye candy yeah. than it is anything terribly exacting. I think. Yes, sir. So I know you guys talked about like home run hitters and how that's exciting, but I mean, you also mentioned how movies idle on bases as well. Do you see players like Aaron Floyd this year becoming more prevalent on teams, especially deeper in the season? Well, Terrence Gore can't hit. <laughs> <laughs> like at all. Well, He's, that's one issue. Yeah, so like at all. Yeah. He's a perfect postseason roster guy, though. Like we saw with the Cubs, he got that big stolen base. I, I think that base, like the Dodgers were an incredibly talented team, but they could not situationally hit because their guys are built on homers and walks. And that really hurt them in the, in the World Series. I mean, it hurt them earlier in the postseason, too. They were much more talented than the Brewers, and they barely advanced. I think, yeah, I think baseball is aware of the fact that, well, it, it all stems to me from the simple fact that when there's no one on base, a walk is exactly as good as a single. But when there's a guy on second, a single is three times better than a walk. And so, but the guys have been trained that they, they needed to draw walks. They needed to draw or, walks. Or, just to interrupt, we're hitting the ball to the right side is better than a walk. And out it can advances be. a runner exactly. 90 feet. It really can be. I mean, and, and I think it's really enjoyable, actually, to watch someone do that, to watch Justin Turner know the situation and the pitcher know the situation and him, try, both men at the peak of their careers, trying to do their best to do a si very simple activity. Um, that we can all do, that we can do in batting cages, just hit the ball to this side of the field. I think that's really fun. You know, it's a, it's a, maybe it's not sexy, but it's fun. It's fun to watch. I think it'll come back around. Um, I, covering the A's, uh, they're known for the whole money ball thing, which is actually trying to find the undervalued assets. And the last few years, that what they've decided that is, is athleticism, uh, which is why they drafted Kyler Murray, the Oklahoma quarterback, with their first round pick last year. And they are hopeful he will be a big base stealer uh, he'll get on base, he'll disrupt things. They think that's now the undervalued thing. And when they start to do it, then other teams start to do it, and it kind of starts to swing back around a little bit. So what you're suggesting is we're going through a phase now. I think we always are going through a phase. And not necessarily a good one at the moment. <laughs> yes. Ahead, Mr. Tom. Kepner? Well, so the one way that's unfortunately seems to be going away is, is you could market your starting pitchers. I mean, to me, it'd be like, hey, t tonight go see, I mean, think about the Tigers a few years ago. Tonight you can see Max Scherzer. Tomorrow you can see David Price. The next day you can see Justin Verlander. Market those guys. This is their game. But we're not seeing that anymore because starters are going less and less because there's so many good pitchers now. Blake Snell was saying it yesterday when he won the Cy Young. He's like, with 180 innings, he's like, 
it's not about going 220 innings anymore or even really 200. It's about give me your best 180 innings or your best 140 or whatever, and we'll backfill the rest with really good starters. So that's another thing. It's like I think that would be a great way to market um, individual stars would be to, to highlight your starting pitchers, but in, except for a small handful of teams, they can't do that. Ty Tyler's written this before, and he's right, and I've stolen it from him for TV. <laughs> I don't give him credit for it. I just steal it. Uh, no, I did give you credit <laughs> no, you for do. it. No, you do. You're good about yeah. it. The, um, remember, in all the other sports, your best player is playing the fourth quarter. Does Brady come out with five minutes to go? How about LeBron? Is he on the bench down a stretch of a close game? Does Federer and Nadal not play a fifth set? How about back nine of a major golf tournament? You know, it, does Tiger, you know, take it, did they get a replacement for him with five holes to go? Baseball, you don't see the great pitcher have to navigate through guile, through athletic accomplishment in the late innings of a game. You saw it a little bit two years ago with Verlander when he beat the Yankees, and that was fun to watch. I don't want to see an obscure relief pitcher. I could care less, making $800,000 a year that nobody that you can't pick out of a lineup. I don't want to see Evan Body gets one out, and then I got to go take him out and get another guy in, and a game takes three hours to play an inning. And Tyler's right. The great pitcher, to see the great pitcher perform, Bob Gibson, when he did it for the World Series in the 60s, Pedro Martinez, Randy, all the great pitchers that you can think of in history of baseball, they're obsolete now. And that's a major problem because they're draws. And people would get into that. 120 pitches, and they're afraid to get hurt. He's this, they got arm, or the money they spent on him. But it's a major problem for the sport. It's a, again, star power is one thing. And then on the other hand, the desire to win are not necessarily in sync. They're, they're in the opposite of sync because the data has shown us the starting pitchers aren't as good the fourth time through the order. But you're right. When Justin Verlander's going for a complete game, who doesn't want to see that? It's wonderful television, but it's... But it's been proven that, in, except in extremely rare cases, it's, it's a bad thing for the team. And they're not going to do it. I mean, if they get to 120 pitches now, how many times did a Dodger throw 120 pitches this year? Probably zero. I, I think zero is about right. And <laughs> the metrics are showing that the best players now are younger, and it's become a young player's game, not an older player's game. So you're seeing guys, once they kind of get name recognition, they're not getting big contracts. They're kind of moving on, and they're having shorter careers. So you don't have the big names sticking around forever. It's getting younger and younger every year, baseball. What we need to see, what, we, what you want to see when you tune in is greatness. And you were talking about your friend who, who was interested in, the, in watching the Yankee games because Judge and Stanton and those guys are great. And you want to see greatness. And if you take away the starting pitchers, if I go to a, a Rays game, it's like, oh, who's pitching? Let's, you know, oh, just a bunch of guys are pitching. You know, a bunch of guys based on matchups to try to get the best. That's not as exciting as saying, like, Blake Snell's pitching. All right, he's a Cy Young winner. I'm going to get excited for that. We want to see greatness. And that's the thing I worry about with this pitching thing is, they're not letting us see greatness anymore because they just pull a guy and bring in someone else. And in terms of marketing, I just if Blake Snell walked into this room, could any of you identify him? <laughs> Is he wearing his uniform? <laughs> the best pitcher in the American League, and I got four hands. There's your, there's your dilemma with marketing. What do you do? How do you do it? And, and that, you know, God bless Rob Manford and, and, and Fox. They've got a real selling job to do. Next question, yes. Well, first of all, it's a little overrated with the amount of, because the Yankees and the Red Sox are going to make the playoffs every year. And that's two out of five in the American League. That's 40%. Plus, you got to throw Houston in now. They're going to make the playoffs basically every year, too. That's 60%. And remember, the Royals won a World Series, and they get to it, and then they disappeared because they, they, they put everything in their pile. Were you that boring? Look what? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we put everything in our pile. We put everything in to put the chips in the middle of the table. And after they win or they make a run at it, they have to then bail out. The Indians are going to do this next. 
They have to bail out because they can't sustain it year in and year out, year in and year out. And there's only seven or eight teams that can in baseball, and that's, a pro that's the issue that I have. Sure. Baseball's got the best postseason, and because less teams, the percentage of teams that make the postseason in baseball is less than the other sport. What is it, 33%? You said 10 uh, 38 out of 30. 38% in football, 10, 33. 10 out of 30, yeah. yeah. All right, and then of course in football, the NBA, the NBA it's 50. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than 50. Yeah. 16, 16 out of 30, yeah. And then the NHL is more than 50, and football's 38%. Yeah. Yeah. So baseball's actually got the best percentage, but to, I ask you right now, next year, Yankees and Red Sox going to make the playoffs? Yeah. Yeah. Are the Astros going to make it? Yeah. And the Indians going to win the division? Okay, so that's four teams. And the Dodgers, too. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm just doing the American League. Yeah. So, that's, so that's four teams. Four teams. Yeah. There's one spot available, and they're playing for one game. They're not playing Over for a, a course of 162 one games. Game. So what, so what are we going to have some of these teams do? What are they going to do? They're going to spend $200 million to try to play for one game? It makes it very dicey for the sport. But that's a, that they've dealt with that problem for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how they can solve that. They've done everything they can with revenue sharing to sort of even it out a little bit. But it's a, all the other sports have a salary cap. Baseball doesn't. So the Cowboys can't spend more than the Green Bay Packers. But basically, the Packers, the little market, can spend the same as the Cowboys can. Well, Kansas City can't spend the same as the Yankees. And eventually, that's going to come back. NBA, they spend the same amount of money. Knicks can't freaking buy players. They're they over the salary cap. <laughs> New York has been terrible for 30 years. You think that would happen in New York with the baseball? or well, the Mets, they stink. But, <laughs> but, but the, the salary cap is a problem. Baseball has to overcome that every year. It's very difficult. Wait, say that again. You think it's similar to what everyone has seen before? Obviously, Jersey Water, it's uh -huh. improved by paper. This is only about baseball. And you're using the kind of journalism that a lot of people hate. Mm -hmm. Like, you're trying to make money for the sport. Like, yeah. Do you think that has something to do with it? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think that, well, the subscription covers everything, right? Uh, the question is, I, I do not feel certain that it is going to work. I think it's a really good bet and a good idea. And I think that I'm glad that for the industry, you know, and I think my colleagues here would agree with me in that we need something like this as an industry to, to continue on because without it, the newspapers are not, you know, with the exception of a few elite ones, there's just not enough business there to keep them running. You know, I worked at a couple of newspapers before that and the deadlines keep getting earlier. You know, it's just hard. It's getting harder and harder to do your job. Uh, as far as what could, what could hinder us from, from growing, I think that in some cities, you know, with the same problems that we're talking about with the attendance, you know, Chris was talking about Tampa Bay. You know, they average, I think, something like 8,000 fans a game, and they average probably fewer than that of fans online. And so if we're trying to have a writer and we're trying to send him around the country to cover the Tampa Bay Rays for us, are there going to be enough people uh, willing to put, fork out $50 a year to, to read that uh, and to read whatever else? Probably not, my guess is. You know, I think in some cities it can, it can work really well, and I, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done. Uh, but it's... it's it's hard to, to have a one size fit all model for 400 writers across, you know, 55 markets. And plus, I mean, we're expanding into England for soccer. And it's, it's a lot. Um, I'm really glad that my bosses are trying this. Um, but yeah, we'll see where it goes. I can't guarantee anything. I'm just happy that we have this opportunity because, you know, you can speak to anyone there. We have a lot more freedom to write the stories that we uh, want to. Deadlines are, are a, a huge hassle at, at newspapers. They really are. Tyler can speak to that. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I, I'll, what I can tell you is that I hope it succeeds, and I'm happy that I get to see if it does. Let me ask a general question from you guys. How, how the internet, social media has changed the way, if any, in the way you cover a game now. It used to be a deadline at 11, 11.30 at night, and now there's no deadline or every minute is a deadline. How's it changed for you, Tyler, for instance? Well, I was going to defer to, to, to Susan as a, as a beat writer, um, you know, but you know, because they're much more in, invested in every detail of a big game. But certainly, 
the immediacy. I mean, I, when I, I, my years on the beat were 1998 to 2009, um, and I didn't get Twitter until 2009. Um, so I would really hope to get a story that no one had and then have a you know, clean hit on it in the next day's paper. You know, the next morning, people would wake up and they'd see the post in the Daily News and Newsday and Bergen Record and wherever else, and they wouldn't see what I had, you know. But that's so, that has, in, within 10 years, become so outdated, um, you know. And, and now it's, it's all, you want it right now. You know, if I, if I come up with something, it's not, usually, it's not really my purview anymore, but like if I come up with some big breaking news item or whatever, I want to get it out instantly. Um, and that changes the, the whole game, you know. And I'm sure, you know, Susan in particular could probably relate to that, like, you know, wanting to get stuff out immediately within a, during the game, right? Yeah, but for the most part, I mean, I try to save stuff for the paper if I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. I've got it by myself, but it's... You don't put it so out quick, yeah. Uh, it's very rare okay. If okay. I, okay. that I don't. Um, I mean, like last night, I mm -hmm. wrote my story before I tweeted it, mm -hmm. because once you tweet something, everybody else jumps on but it, and it's not it yours. Yeah. Yeah. Put it right. up. I mean, they'll right. have an hour on it ahead right. of it. You'll Maybe have a, an hour. Basically, you'll have a yeah. little head start. Yeah. yeah, no, Twitter's changed the way beat writers operate, certainly. Um, we probably spend way too much time on it for something that <laughs> brings us essentially zero income, um, the, either the paper or obviously personally. Uh, but yeah, it, it winds up being sort of, I, I look back at the pre-Twitter days, and I think the baseball writing, all sports writing in general, maybe all kinds of uh, journalism were better because people could take more time uh, instead of constantly checking Twitter because you're looking to see what other what news is breaking, and and saying you know so and so just hit a home run, everybody's watching it on TV. You don't need to spend so much time on it. But I think the quality of every the writing was so much better pre Twitter. Rick, well, I got to experience all the eras. I guess I started at the Post Dispatch when it was an afternoon paper, and did 13 years there with all the time in the world to write a story. And you could, you could put together some stuff. You'd be the last person in the clubhouse every night if you wanted to be, and you pretty much had to be. And then I got to do a bunch more years with, as a morning paper with a beat guy. It was okay. Now, it, it, the, hard, the difference now is you have to be more responsible to online things than I ever had dreamed of. I used to enjoy like going to the Dodger Stadium, and when the game was over at, at 12.30 St. Louis time, I was done. There was nobody to account for online. If it, Ended at 12.28, too bad. 12.28, Cardinals win, Cardinals lose, I'm out of here. No, you can't do that. You have to write another glowing piece for the overnight online edition. And uh, it, it, it's much more work involved, not as much fun. It's still fun, but not as much. And not nearly as much as it was when you had all day to write it. Although there's sometimes that afternoon paper, you can take too long, you outsmart yourself and think, well, that's not good enough. I gotta do, you know, you just get it in. As a consumer, how has the evolution of reporting sports, baseball in particular, uh, how have you assessed all that? I still read the papers every day, and I'm only I'm a minority of that. I mean, I read Tyler. I mean, I'm not here in L.A., so I don't get Pedro, but I've read Rick forever. I read, I'm a giant fan, so I'm always looking at the A stuff. So I go newspaper. I think there's too much information on all these Twitter stuff and everything. And when I'm on the air or when I'm doing something with, with radio shows, I don't want to be overloaded. I don't want to have 3,000 things in my head. Well, Tyler said that and Pedro said this. And, oh, by the way, Rick had this on Twitter. I don't, you know, I, it's almost too much. Let me go on air and get a basic understanding of what's going on and do, my, and, and do my thing and let the chips fall where they may. And if I get something wrong occasionally and something breaks when I don't know about it and it takes me 20 minutes to figure it out, the world's not going to end. How many of you consume the baseball stuff on a daily basis by Twitter? Hmm. Okay. How many of you consume baseball stuff on the internet, reading the various newspapers and columns? So the, does anybody read the newspaper anymore? Uh, online. Online, okay. So does anybody have a newspaper delivered? Yeah. <laughs> Hooray! Older people, though. Older people. But and that, uh, that's what's really fascinating. Like as a consumer in Peoria, Illinois, mm -hmm. you get one or two sentences on a handful of names in a long form article. You have to go other places if you want to read about the Dodgers or the Yankees or whatever. You can read about the Cubs. It's going on the Cardinals. So. Between the internet 
and Twitter. Uh, one or the other. Internet, Twitter. So it's still internet. There's still hope. Yes. A couple more questions. Yes, sir. So I know you were talking earlier um, before the call about how the part of the problem with the, I mean, the difference between the MBA and the MB, MLB is the market and how like we know the big names in the MLB where we can talk about how like some people don't even know from like Tyler. In my opinion, part of that is so like since we're talking about Twitter, I follow both the MLB and the NBA on Twitter. I'll see on MLB, all I see is like Yankees, Red Sox, Dodgers. That's all I see. Whereas the NBA, every night, I'll see from the Golden State Warriors to the Brooklyn Nets. I'll see all of that, and I know no one really cares about the Nets anymore, but I'll still see all of that. So my question is, how does how much of that falls not on necessarily like you guys, the reporters of the team, but like the actual organization itself to go out and market to the younger generation, to show the Mike Trouts, to show um, like the Matt Chapman of the A's, and show the people that um, the smaller market teams You know, um, well, I know, I'll give you an example about baseball. Trout wouldn't participate in a home run hitting contest this year. Is that baseball's fault? The reason why he didn't, because they were mad at him based on last year with the, with the nobody making any money. It was in D.C. It's not too far from Philly. Trout didn't participate. Baseball didn't have Mike Trout at the home run hitting contest. Now, you tell me that Manfred didn't want Trout. That's a perfect marketing tool. They love that. Everybody loves that home run hitting contest. I think the big problem that, that from a marketing standpoint is the ESPN with baseball and ESPN of the NBA, it's a totally, ESPN lives with that NBA. They got every show dedicated to that NBA. Now, you're going to tell me ESPN's not as powerful as it once was. I don't buy it. I still think most people go to ESPN to see what's going on. Tell me that, yes, uh, that you're going to see a Trey Young highlight with the Atlanta Hawks. You're going to see that before you see somebody on the Royals. I guarantee you that. Two small markets, two bad teams. They're going to show you Trey Young dunking, making a three, doing this, doing that, because they have a re relationship with the NBA. They pay $1.4 billion a year to the NBA. $1.4 billion. That's why all their shows are located with the NBA. So I think a lot of it, to me, a lot of it is from that standpoint. I think the teams try to market to players. I think they're trying to do a better job with social media, and some of them are, but baseball is not as friendly uh, online as a lot of the other sports right. are. You can't get games streaming uh, in your own market from your team. I mean, the streaming issue is a real problem. And for a long time, I think they've backed off a little. MLB was cracking down on people that would run clips on Twitter, um, you know, make GIFs, all that sort of thing. Baseball really cracked down on it. I think they've eased up a little bit, but that's a nice way to grow a fan base if you've got people out there coming up with you know, funny memes and stuff, and instead of cracking down, like, celebrate that, use them. Uh, and they're trying a little bit more. Uh, some of the teams, social media, that's starting to be funnier, more clever, and little, you know, kind of digs at each other, and I think that helps with what you're talking about. You go online, you see a little bit from everything, and they're trying, but uh, they've got a long way to go, I think. Well, I see, you know, I, I, I can, you're exactly right. If, if you threw a bat flip or anything like that, you'd get a fastball underneath your, your nose the next time you batted. But I'm not surprised if, if, uh, if somebody celebrates a, a, a sack sometimes in the middle of the field of a nothing game that some offensive lineman doesn't cut block him the next time either, you know. I think there's some, I, I don't mind those celebrations as long as they're fast. I don't want to have a guy go under the goalpost and answer the phone and say, okay, you know, and, or something like that. Just <laughs> celebrate, throw the ball in the stand. Jump in the stands, that's okay. But let's not have a choreograph or have a guy bowling and 18 guys fall down, you know. Just, just <laughs> might as well just hand the ball to the ref then. But what about baseball? The, well, the base, bad base, flip I, and I any I, of that I, stuff. I mean, Are you okay with that? I, I am, it depends what the situation is. Um, like Puig bat flips a lot. Well, he's an excitable player though. I don't know that all the time he knows he's doing something that might irritate somebody else. He doesn't care. I'm okay with that, I guess. It doesn't delay the game. It adds a little spice to the game. The football celebrations delay the game. Baseball doesn't. It flips his bat and runs. Uh, or, or, or so if it's proportionate, you're okay with yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I love it. 
I love it. More backflips, please. That would be awesome. They're great. As you said, Charlie, it's an entertainment industry. Yes. Yeah. The point is to have a good time. When when the when Ed Rodriguez threw his glove down after Puig hit that home run, it was like that was the best moment of the whole season for me. <laughs> I couldn't best believe season, it. Best season moment of the season was Chris Sale when when the Red Sox had just given up four in the bottom of the sixth, Chris and they Nance. come in and their shoulders are down. And he gets in their face. There's electricity. There's a moment. They score three in the seventh, one in the eighth, and five in the ninth. To me, that was the pivotal moment of the World Series, and he wasn't going to pitch for another day. Last question. Yes, sir. Then the third baseman from the second ba first base side of second makes a backhanded play. You think it's fun calling that? <laughs> if, again, it's one of those moments where somebody got on me about it a while back. How could the third baseman make a backhanded play behind second base? It's a shift, you dope. You know what, what? That is how you know. That's the evolution of the game. Is it better? Is it worse? I don't know. Talk to the producers and directors about that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one last. All right, back there. I, actually, I think that it's actually functioning better. So I think now you're seeing longer replays because managers are only using it when it's something that's really legit and hard. To I think managers now know what they should have, you know, checked and what shouldn't. So there are few of them. They just take longer because they're closer. I, I think we just need a little bit of fine tuning, and I would like to see the play that really irks me is uh, when you overslide second base uh, and say you you miss it, you you slide off the base by. by a second. By, yeah, and, and then they take four minutes to, to review whether it happened or not, and that just feels like a waste of everyone's time. That's all I think about during those things. It's just like, wh who is going to be ill-served by just treating it as a successful steal? And I think a couple of those changes, a couple of those tweaks would make the system a lot, a lot less frustrating for people. Yeah, it's imperfect, uh, but I, I don't like every close play now. Every close play, the guy's going to stay on the base, and the ump's going to go, you know, are, are we... And AJ Hinch will hold up his hand. Right, hold on. You, you know, and the okay. batter, the guy doesn't leave the field. That's a little overwrought to me, but I don't know how you change it. But, but unlike any close play before where they couldn't even put it on the scoreboard, at least the fans can participate. Yeah, in the, that's, that's like, good. It's like a game show. You know, you get to clap for the thing. That, that, that part is fun. Yeah, I mean, there is a Everybody gets to see all the replays, and they can decide themselves. There the is a great good. dramatic moment after the completion of a replay when the umpires take the headset point at second base, out. And it, it's just an exciting little... Yeah, but my, my nightmare is, because I'm so big on, you know, the last out of the World Series, oh, that last right, moment, yeah. is if that were to ever end a season, you know, where the yeah. two outs, the bottom of the ninth inning, and, you know, we're waiting on the umpire, and that's the moment. Because every team should have that moment, you know, sure. that last out, and everybody jumps around, and I just, like the Yankees-Red Sox series this year ended with one of those. Mm -hmm. It was a first-round series, so it's easy to forget, but I just, I would hate it if... if a, Bang, bang, play, and it goes to an umpire to end the World Series. Oh. I want to thank you guys first, but uh, Tyler Kepner from the New York Times, Pedro Moore from The Athletic, Susan Slusser from the San Francisco Chronicle, Rick Hummel from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and Chris Russo from Mars. Thank you all. Thank you very much.